I had considered in the last lecture a special class of motion, that is motion with constant acceleration, because I suggested that there are many situations that I might encounter where the motion of a system or an object might be, might be with constant acceleration or at least approximately constant. We might make a good approximation. And so based on that seed of an idea and appreciating that the velocity is uh, the rate of change of position and the acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, there are consequences derived algebraically from that, and I'll just write them here by way of a little bit of a summary, that the final velocity of an object is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration multiplied by time, that the final position is equal to the initial position plus the initial velocity multiplied by the time plus one half of the acceleration multiplied by the time squared, and that the final velocity squared is equal to the initial velocity squared plus 2a times delta x. There are no particular order, but I have those just coldly memorized. They are welded into my uh, my, I guess, my psyche, my thinking about physics, those equations are sort of automatic because they have great utility for solving problems. Well, today's discussion is very specific because there is an example case of motion with constant acceleration that I would like to solve that is the case of falling under the influence of gravity. I think we're aware of the story, at least mildly apocryphal, of Galileo at Pisa going to the top of the Leaning Tower and dropping objects and discovering that the rate at which objects change their velocity as they fall to the surface of the Earth under the influence of gravity is the same regardless of their masses. I could, for example, take a very, very small bead and drop it and time how long it takes to fall to the bottom of the tower. I could then take a cannonball upon which the force of gravity is significant and drop it. And it would accelerate to the ground in such a way that it would land at the same time. Now, under careful experimentation, this is not explicitly true because I have ignored the viscous drag of the air that it, as it falls. And indeed, because of a larger cross-sectional area, you might reason that the cannonball is subject to more viscous drag as it falls than is a small bead. Also, I have discounted the observable fact that the acceleration due to gravity actually weakens, that is, the magnitude of that acceleration decreases as I go further from the surface of the Earth. And these two issues we are going to explore in significant detail in this course. But for the moment, I'll imagine that Galileo's observation, when, when described in general, are in fact true that the acceleration due to gravity near the surface of the Earth that we call g is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. And immediately my conversation will turn from a theoretical one to an eminently practical one. When we use the symbol g in our physics, and not just in this context, but in every context, the symbol g stands for the magnitude of the acceleration vector. As a magnitude of a vector, g, therefore, is positive. Well, I suppose it would be more accurate to say it is neither positive nor negative. It is a magnitude. But for the purposes of our calculations, I use g as if it's a positive number. However, this vector associated with the acceleration due to gravity is directed downward toward the center of the Earth an idea that we'll add more flesh to later in our course. And so as an object falls under the influence of gravity, its acceleration is g, 9.8 meters per second squared, where the acceleration is a vector. Now, of course, vectors can be positive, vectors can be negative. So this thing might manifest itself in an in a equation as a positive number or a negative number, but that depends entirely on how I choose my coordinate system. The choice of coordinate system determines whether g will appear in my equations as a positive or a negative acceleration. I find that to be a bit of a hassle. And so what I've done to avoid that completely, an issue that I need not consider, is that when I solve problems involving the acceleration due to gravity, that is when I solve free fall problems, I always choose upward to be the positive direction. Always, 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 in every case. I choose upward to be the positive direction. What that does for me is it means that the acceleration vector directed downward is always negative, and I'm done. No more thinking. 
I might encounter a problem where I believe that I might be convenienced by making a different choice. For example, someone could be standing atop a cliff and throw an object downward. I might immediately think that since the initial velocity is directed downward, it might be a good idea to choose downward to be the positive direction. And you may do that and get all the correct answers that you like. I will never do that. Always I choose upward to be the positive direction so that the acceleration due to gravity when I calculate will be negative 9.8 meters per second squared. But the symbol G refers to 9.8 meters per second squared and is the magnitude of the vector. And so what I choose to do is to take my three kinematic equations that I've already written here in summary and recast them for the purpose of describing the vertical motion of a projectile, or well, not a projectile yet, but an object moving in one dimension under the influence of gravity, the issue of projectile motion will take up um, in just a few days. But for now, I'm going to take the very first equation on my list, that is v is equal to v naught plus at, and I'm going to recast it f uh, into a version of the equation that might be more sensible for discussing and describing the vertical motion of an object under the influence of gravity. So I'm going to appreciate that when I'm describing the vertical motion of a thing that I'll use the vertical component of the velocity. Typically, in terms of position, it's very common, customary, to use the y-axis as the vertical position axis. So I'll say vy is equal to, now I have the y-velocity's initial uh, compo the, the y component of the velocity's initial value, which I'll say is vy naught. And then I have the acceleration multiplied by time in the original equation. I'm going to put my own preference into this. So have a care and keep in mind the discussion moments ago. I will always choose upward to be the positive direction. So the acceleration due to gravity will be negative g multiplied by t. So in my mind, this is a free fall version of the customary velocity equation. And it is according to my own style. So you should bear that in mind, make note of that. That one I took my time with, now I'm going to go through the others um, more rapidly. Uh, instead of x is equal to x naught plus v zero t plus one half at squared, I'll say y is equal to y naught plus v y naught times t plus, well, I shouldn't have said plus there, pardon me. What I mean is minus, of course, minus one half g multiplied by t squared. And that's my second equation. My third then, very easily written, is that vy squared is equal to vy naught squared. Again, I messed up with the, with the sign there. vy naught squared minus 2g delta y. Well, that was a very simple thing. It is a change of notation to solve a particular problem, which is useful to prevent me from getting distracted or confused as to what I'm describing. The description is the motion of an object falling freely under the influence of gravity with an acceleration equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. On our assessments and exams, it's quite typical in our physics to approximate g as 10 meters per second squared, rounding the 9.8 up. After all, the acceleration due to gravity does vary around the surface of the Earth, and where near sea level it's 9.8 meters per second squared just about everywhere, there are variations. Uh, not so great as 10, but there are variations of the acceleration due to gravity. But I'll use 10 in approximation, and, and I'm giving you permission here in all of your exam and quiz calculations to use 10. It's quite simple. Because if I imagine that I release an object from rest and it falls under the influence of gravity, I appreciate what the acceleration means is that the velocity will change by 10 meters per second every second. You see, I'm saying 10, not 9.8. It'll change by 10 meters per second every second. It's part of everyone's life experience that as an object falls, it goes faster and faster and faster. So after the first second, it will be moving at 10 meters per second. After the second second, it will be moving at 20 and 30 and 40, gaining 10 meters per second every second that it falls. It is not long before this becomes absurd because you could jump out of an airplane at some thousands of meters above the surface of the earth and before you hit the ground you'd be going much faster than the speed of sound and that's not what happens because of the influence of viscous drag but for short time periods on short time scales with low uh, viscous drag essentially gain 10 meters per second every second as such i go further and further and further in each successive second that i fall 
A thing that sometimes students do in problem solving, and I guess I'm going to allude to it more as I go, because in a moment I'm going to solve an actual problem involving the motion of an object under the influence of gravity, but a problem, a thing that students encounter, uh, or an idea that gets into their heads, is that I will take the vertical motion and describe that differently than the, than the I, I'm sorry, I'll take the upward motion and describe that differently than the falling motion. If I take an object like this marker here and I throw it up in the air, it's some curious behavior. It rises, eventually comes to rest, and then falls again back to the earth. That's commonly experienced. I need not divide that motion into two parts because the motion is motion with constant acceleration. The acceleration does not change. In the coordinate system that I would choose, the acceleration is negative g on the way up, and the acceleration is negative g at the instance of maximum height, and the acceleration is negative g on the way down. It is motion with constant acceleration, which is why I choose it this way, and nothing will change that. The acceleration is negative g the whole time. But it makes physical sense. If I have an acceleration of negative g and I'm rising with a positive velocity and a negative acceleration, I'll slow down. When I reach the top of the motion, it is true that the velocity is zero. That does not mean that the acceleration is also zero. No, the acceleration is still negative 9.8 meters per second squared, which negative 10 if you like, which is why the thing falls then under the influence of gravity. With a negative acceleration and a negative velocity, it speeds up on the way down. So the motion is entirely consistent if I imagine it is one continuous motion up and down with the same constant acceleration. So a quick example, because a very simple idea, I need to fill in the space with an application of this to a problem. So some uh, are aware of our friends Slim, uh, and here is a throwback to about 1996, uh, before uh, Slim and Peg got married. We see Slim on the street below and he has an engagement ring and Peg is leaning out the window. And Slim has the engagement ring and he says, will you marry me? And Peg says, yes, how romantic. And then he throws the engagement ring up to the window. I don't know why she doesn't just come down, but then I wouldn't have a physics problem to solve. So the ring thrown by Slim is gonna move under the influence of gravity. He throws it upward here, I've shown, with a velocity of 10 meters per second to Peg with her outstretched hands waiting to catch it at the window and the window happens to be four meters above. There's a little bit of a complication here that is annoying more than it is instructive. Do I concern myself with the distance between Slim's hand and the ground and her hands relative to the windowsill? There are problems out there to be solved which take this into account. For example, somewhere, some physics student is solving a problem of a basketball player who's shooting a basketball at a hoop well, the basketball is not shot from the floor level. It depends on the height of the player. So I choose my coordinate system, and there's this height and that height. and It convolutes the problem without adding any physics. So the four meters that I've indicated here on my diagram is the four meters of displacement between where the ring leaves Slim's hand and when it arrives in Peg's hand. I'm making the assumption that she does, in fact, catch it. Nothing tragic happens here. Um, and so that's the four meters there. I'm not going to worry about the heights or whatever the size of the window or the weather or what day of the week it is. I'm simply going to have that four meters of displacement. So once I establish that, there are a great many things that are unknown. I do not know how much time it takes between when Slim throws the ring and when Peg catches it. I also do not know the velocity of the ring when Peg catches it. I don't know how high the ring is going to go. There are a multitude of things that I can calculate. I had a professor who said that what you should do when you study physics and you're given a problem to solve is find everything that conceivably can be found out about the thing. Well, I'm going to save myself some time today and not calculate everything, but I'll show you some techniques for finding a few specific things. For example, I'm interested in knowing how much time passes between the instant that Slim releases the ring and when Peg catches it. Here's the thing. It has to be those two instances in time. Because before Slim throws the ring, he, well, in the process of throwing, I guess I should say, he's got his hand here and he oomphs upward with his hand. Well, in that instant, the acceleration of the ring is not 9.8 meters per second squared. The acceleration of the ring is something different. It's slim throw acceleration. And then as the ring touches Peg's hand at the window, the instant it touches her, the acceleration of it is not 9.8 meters per second squared. So all I'm describing here is between those two instances. The instant immediately at, as the throw happens, right, as it leaves Slim's hand, and the instant it arrives at Peg's hand. 
So I would like to determine the time. The third of my equations will do me no good because it doesn't have the time in it. The first equation is attractive because it has the time and it's the simpler of the three equations, but it requires that I know the final velocity, which I do not yet know. So I, I immediately go for the second or the second equation on my list here as I've listed them. Uh, and I would typically rewrite it that y is equal to y naught plus v y naught t plus one half uh, or minus one half g t squared. It's funny that I said plus there while it's clearly written on the board with a negative sign. At any rate, here I go. I have to choose a coordinate system for any of these positions, velocities, or accelerations to have meaning. I can choose the coordinate system any way I like. I harp on this all the time. And it's not because I think it's an area where students make mistakes. It's because it has such deep fundamental meaning in all of our physics, from this introductory physics all the way to the fanciest physics that's being done. I must choose a coordinate system in which I make these measurements. I've already said that I always choose upward to be the positive direction. But it's also true that I like to choose, whenever possible, the initial position to be equal to zero. I find that to be a convenient thing. So I write this icon on my diagram that has an a arrow pointing upward, and a little hash mark, and a zero. It's as if I wrote a number line. I can imagine that the number line is there, arranged vertically, so I can define all of the infinite positions of the ring as it rises and falls. So I'm going to choose the initial position to be equal to zero and upward to be the positive direction. If I chose differently, if I chose Peg's hand to be zero and downward to be the positive direction, I would still get the same answers. By the same answers, I mean they'll have the same magnitudes. There might be sign differences in the answers that I get. For example, if I chose downward to be the positive direction, I would find that the velocity of the ring when it arrived was positive um, in this, whereas a person with a different coordinate system might find it negative. There could be differences in signs, but that's fine because I've specified my coordinate system. I've made it public. So when I give my answer in the context of that coordinate system, there won't be any, amb any ambiguity as to what I'm saying. I'd better make a start here. So uh, y is equal to y naught plus v y naught times t minus one half g t squared. I'm going to flesh this out with some numbers. The final position of the ring is, in fact, four meters. It's, in fact, four meters because I chose it to be four meters. I, and, and I'm forcing my solution to that point. I'm not choosing some other final position. If I were, for example, looking for the maximum height, which I will, by the way, then four will not be the final position. But presuming that peg is going to catch it, the final position is equal to four. The initial position, the initial y position, we call y naught, is zero. I'll write it in. If I were solving this problem just to get my homework done, I wouldn't write it. But I'll write it in there so it keeps the place. Zero plus the initial velocity, which is 10 meters per second positive, directed upward multiplied by the time, which I do not know, multiplied by the time, which I do not know, minus 4.9 times t squared. I'm very accustomed to seeing that 4.9, which is, of course, half of 9.8. I've solved a lot of problems. It happens all the time. And so now what I have is the idea of motion under the influence of gravity reduced to a purely mathematical statement about the behavior of time in this particular context. You can see immediately, of course, that it is quadratic. I'm going to save a little bit of time here in the lecture, because we don't need to see me performing mathematics as we go. This is quadratic. And I'll use the quadratic formula to solve it, and that is a skill that we all have. So I'll do sort of a cooking show thing, and instead of completing the recipe, I'll say, and I've already prepared one. And I'll imagine that I've solved this quadratic formula, and I've discovered the roots. In fact, you'll find that the roots of this are two possibilities for the time. One of them is 1.49 seconds is a solution to this equation. And a second uh, possibility for the time is 0 0.55 seconds. It's very often, uh, it very often happens when solving physics problems, that when I take the roots and it involves time, I'll get a positive root and a negative root, and I throw the negative root away because negative time that doesn't make any sense, and so I'll throw that root away. But here I have two positive roots, and so the way that I'm going to distinguish which one is the correct one, which one of the one is I want, is I have to consult the problem and consider the meaning of the roots. Appreciate the fact that after Slim throws the ring, there are two instances in time when the position of the ring is four meters. That happens twice. That's the reason, that's the whole point of quadratics. When I have this function that's quadratic and it's squared, it's a parabola, and so it intersects an axis at two places. 
and intersects a particular position in two places. So the 0 0.55 seconds is when the ring passes the window on the way up. And she could very well catch it in that instant. It could be on its way up, but she could reach out and grab it. It's up to me to tell you that that's not what happened. What happened instead is that the ring proceeded above the window and under the influence of gravity, slowed to a stop and then fell back down again to arrive at Peg's hand on the way down. This is the second instance in time when the position happens to be four meters. This is the second instant in time that the position is four meters, and that is the one that has my interest. If the problem were stated in another way, I would choose the other route. But the route that works for me here is the root t is equal to 1.49 seconds. I might say 1.5 seconds for the convenience of my calculation. It's true of this kind of problem solution that once you establish the time, once you start getting values, things loosen up quite a bit and it becomes easy uh, to calculate uh, more and more quantities. For example, I might like to know what is the velocity of the ring when it arrives uh, at Peg's hand. Well, I have an equation for the y velocity. It says that the final y velocity is equal to the initial y velocity, which was 10 meters per second, minus the acceleration, so minus g, which is minus 9.8 meters per second squared, multiplied by the time, but I found the time, 1.49 seconds. So it starts out with a positive velocity, but the negative acceleration is going to take velocity away, velocity away, velocity away, until ultimately it stops because all of the positive velocity will be removed, but the acceleration continues its work. It subtracts and subtracts and subtracts, and so the velocity will become negative on its way down again. And so when I calculate this, of course, I get a negative number, uh, which I'm fairly certain would be negative 4.6-ish meters per second. And I should pause when I do these kinds of solutions and consider. Does that make sense that I got a negative velocity of the answer? We should always do this when we do calculations and get answers. Does it make sense that it's negative? Well, it does. Because in my coordinate system for the solution to this problem, I chose upward to be the positive direction. And therefore, when the ring is on its way downward, it has a negative velocity. And so that makes very, very careful literal sense. I might stop at this point and be content with this information that I found. But I have a little extra bit of interest. And that is this point, a very common question is that this point at the top of the motion, how high is that? How high will a thing go? Is very, very common. Doubtless in our own homework assignments that we'll solve, there'll be a question of how high does a thing rise to? It comes to that forcing the issue. I'm gonna discover how high a thing rises, to how high the ring in this case rises to by forcing the issue and saying when, or I'm sorry, I don't mean when, that would be an issue of time, at what height? is the final y velocity equal to zero. This highest point in the motion has a characteristic that the y velocity at that point is equal to zero meters per second. So I'll force that condition into my equations and solve for position. I do not know at what time that happens. I do not know at what time it happens. Um, but I do know uh, that the velocity is zero at that point. And so I'll choose my third equation. This is a nice example. I get to use all three of the equations. The third equation, that vy squared is equal to v not y squared minus 2g delta y. So the final y velocity squared, I'm saying, is equal to zero. The final y velocity squared is equal to zero. And that's equal to the initial velocity squared, which is 10 squared, which is easily done, is 100, minus 2 times 9.8 times the vertical displacement delta y. That displacement delta y is the final position minus the initial position, which when I consider what that means in my diagram here, according to this coordinate system, the final position minus the initial position is in fact the height. It can early on cause you some consternation that the height doesn't appear in any of your equations. You have to do a little interpretation. And it's possible that you could solve a problem where after you calculate delta y, the vertical displacement, you'll have to do some consideration as to how that relates to the number that you were actually asked to calculate. So a little bit of care. At any rate, if I stir this equation around and solve for delta y, and again, I'll save us some, some trouble here. If I solve this equation for delta y, I'm going to find that it's equal to 5.1 meters.
which makes physical sense because the ring is caught at four meters and I know that it goes above. And so 5.1 meters, certainly above four meters. Uh, and everything makes physical sense. I had told myself that I didn't want to, um, that I wasn't going to calculate any more about this. I had made a decision in advance not to calculate any more. But I've just made a decision of what I'm going to do immediately after this. And so I'd like to do another calculation. The final calculation I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the question, at what time does it reach this maximum height? I'm going to do it in, in an interesting way. What time it uh, takes to reach the maximum height, you say, well, you're going to have to go back to y is equal to y naught plus v naught yt plus 1 or minus 1 half gt squared. You're going to have to use that equation again. Uh, or you're going to have to use uh, the final y velocity is equal to 0 uh, or final y velocity equal to 0. Initial y velocity is 10 minus g times t and solve for it that way. I think that's the preferred way to do it and that, that is the way that I'll do it. However, I want to take a moment to point out something that is useful in problem solving. This is just advice. It's not theoretical physics in any way. When I launch the ring with an initial velocity and it travels upward, the equation y is equal to y naught minus v or plus v. The equation y is equal to y naught plus v y naught t minus one half gt squared. That equation now has an initial velocity and it makes it quadratic. And now I have to solve that thing out. Appreciate the fact that motion under the influence of gravity is symmetric. If I were to film the ring flying vertically upward and stopping at its highest point and run that film in reverse, I would see the ring start from rest and fall to its initial position. It sometimes is advantageous in problem solving to solve the problem in the reverse direction, in reverse time, because then the initial velocity is equal to zero and my equation is no longer quadratic. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna bypass that whole thing, and I'm gonna solve this by saying that the final y velocity, which is equal to zero, is equal to the initial y velocity, which is equal to 10, minus 9.8 times t. I, do, I would do myself a favor here if I chose 10, but I didn't choose 10, so the decimal equivalent is, the reason why I keep pointing at you is I'm asking you to calculate it for me. <laughs> I thought you were gonna queued up on that, and you and I were gonna have a thing where you would just feed me the number and it would go right in. 10 divided by 9.8. So the time it takes to rise to the maximum height is 1.02. Um, I would have done myself a favor through the whole thing if I had simply used 10 for the calculation. I could easily do that in my head, you would see. And as I said, on, on our assessments and our exams and things, you are welcome to use 10 because it will greatly increase your speed at solving problems. Calculation is not, well, Here's an opinion, this is me editorializing. Calculation is not the fun part of doing physics. I suppose someone uh, disagrees. Um, now, the last thing that I would like to do in order to understand this motion as completely as I possibly can is appreciate the fact that often visualizing motion uh, in terms of graphs is, uh, is a, a helpful exercise. And so what I'd like to do is to draw the position, velocity, and acceleration graphs for this motion. So I'm going to quickly uh, devise a graph of position as a function of time uh, to make sure that I, I know exactly what this motion will look like. So here's position uh, measured as a function of time. Now I have two times that are of, oh, I have three times I guess that are of interest. I have and a couple of positions that are of interest. I have the maximum height that it rises to which is about five meters. It's 5.1 but I'm just going to rough this out. Uh, and I have a height uh, of four meters where it's in fact caught. Uh, and then I have two velocities, of, well I have two, pardon me, two um, other positions of interest. That is this initial position at the bottom where it's launched from, which is zero meters. Uh, and then there's a time further along uh, where, uh, that I've discovered is the time that it, well, I've just found the time that it takes to rise to its maximum height is about one second. That means the time that it takes to fall is about two seconds. So on my graph, I'll have two seconds here. And so what I need to do freehand now, and I've done this to myself, is draw a parabola, because position as a function of time is a parabola. It's parabolic motion, and this graph of position as a function of time properly describes the motion of the ring going up and down. Now, fortunately for me, it looks like the motion, because if I follow the ring going up and coming back down again, uh, I'll and move that sideways in time, it would make sort of a parabolic shape if I sort of drug the video along and allowed it to move sideways as it moved vertically. But I have some key points here. Here at five meters, I see the maximum height, and that happens at the halfway point, which is one second. 
along this axis. At four meters, it's caught. So technically the motion stops here. So what I should do maybe is remove uh, some bits of that and make that uh, a dotted line because it never quite gets there. But if it were to continue to fall, it would arrive at zero again two seconds later because the time it takes to rise is equal to the time it takes to fall. And so this is a graph of the position as a function of time. It appears as a parabola. It makes sense. Here is a graph of the velocity as a function of time. You see as I draw it, I've taken care to make sure that I have some negative region here on the graph because the velocity will become negative during the motion. Here's the important, and this is actually, my whole, my whole motivation for drawing graphs was this one in particular. I just felt, draw the complete set. I start with an initial velocity of 10 meters per second here on the vertical axis, and my velocity decreases. That does not invoke a visualization of the motion. And yet it's an important graph because it has all of the features of free fall. Notice, this is a velocity time graph, and so its slope is the acceleration. The slope of that line that I've drawn is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. It has a constant slope the whole time. It's motion with constant acceleration. So the velocity time graph must have a constant slope. In this case, a decreasing value as it goes. There's this special instant here that happens at around one second where the velocity for an instant becomes equal to zero. Notice on this graph that at that instant, when it crosses the time axis, the slope is still negative 9.8 meters per second squared, despite the fact that at the top of the motion, the object has instantaneously come to rest. All of these issues of describing and talking about the nature of free fall motion are really represented on this graph of velocity as a function of time. After it stops at its highest point and its velocity becomes zero meters per second, its velocity then becomes negative as it falls back toward the Earth. Now, it doesn't make it all the way to the ground because it's caught by peg, but the acceleration is constant and therefore the slope of that graph is constant. And sadly, to finish off with something very obvious, if I to make a graph of the acceleration as a function of time, it's the most boring graph in the universe, the acceleration is on the negative side of the acceleration axis, of course, and is equal to negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Constant negative acceleration as a, uh, caused by gravity as an excellent example of motion with constant acceleration. Thank you.